Um, and let me see, do you guys see SQL Server Management Studio right in front of us? Can you guys all see that? Yep, I can see it now. OK. So when you write a query, you see that I'm putting the actual table name right in the from clause, right? And here I put my column names, and I have where filters. And, and in the query, we'd have these kind of hardcore names that are tied directly to the schema of the database. And the problem is, once you have a lot of this in a lot of applications or reports or ETL packages, you've now tightly coupled your applications with the schema. And the reason why that's a problem is, schema is our method of organizing data in a logical way. And it's our way of getting good performance. If we decide that we screwed up schema and that our data is disorganized, we've now frozen the schema because we have all these applications that are tied to it. And that's the problem with tight coupling the applications. But if instead we create views as an intermediary in between, um, in between the tables and the queries, that frees us to reorganize our data underneath it either for performance or for just simple data organization. So that's kind of the, the quick answer. There's a lot of other answers. And if you read that thread, you'll see a lot of people chiming in. But that's the main reason. The other reason is you decouple it for security. If I have tables with a lot of private information, I can create views that only give me very specific information. And I can give access to the view without giving access to the underlying tables. Um, so that's a really good way of getting that decoupling. So yeah, performance, um, data organization, and security are the main reasons to use views. There's another reason to use views, by the way, and that is if we have a really complicated query and we don't want to have to write it out every time, you can just create a view with the query and then reuse the view and not have to type the complexity over and over and over again. So is there a reason you'd use okay. views um, stored procedure? Anybody else? Have well, views are just a query, usually. In fact, that, that's exactly what they are, is just a select statement. Um, a stored procedure has all sorts of other logic, like you can do a lot of complicated math, you can have cursors, you can do inserts and updates, you can create temporary tables. You can do a ton of different things in a stored procedure that you can't do in views. Got it. OK, raise your hand if anybody else has any questions. No? OK, all right. Let's talk about the one thing in the reading that you learned. Um, and it's tough for me because there wasn't a lot of new things in this reading, so I didn't really learn anything. But I can show you that I have a blog post that I wrote about one thing that he talked about that just kind of reminded me to kind of emphasize it. So I wrote a quick blog post about it. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that blog post, but it's on blog.themonastery.com. And uh, I'll just go ahead and quickly open Chrome. And this is the null problem. Um, and uh, he said, if you have a null and a not in clause, um, the comparison will always return a false, and you won't get um, the, the values that you're expecting. And so I saw his demonstration, and then I just kind of wrote my own here um, that I thought was a little bit simpler. So um, this first script creates a couple tables. It creates a customer's table and an orders table. And so I'll just go ahead and highlight that and execute it. And then I insert a bunch of customers. And you can see um, Brad's name here. I should have put Rob's name there. So I'm adding those to the customer's table. And then I'm adding a whole bunch of orders to the orders table. Real quick, do you see how I'm adding the dates here in my insert, where it says year, month, day? From it's it been gone, um, who can type in real quick why I'm doing the date? We read about that earlier. Why is the date in that format? And then I'll go ahead and get the other rest of this. Just to remind people, if you weren't here last week, if, uh, if you want to answer these questions and you don't have a mic, go ahead and you should be able to type them into the questions window or uh, maybe it's called the chat window on your side and you should be able to ask 
you should be able to answer the questions that uh, that Ike is asking. Right. Um, okay. So this uses a subquery which we learned from the reading, and this subquery says, "Give me all the customer IDs from the orders table." And if I execute that, I can see there are three um, customers in the orders table: one, three, and four. And if I said, "Okay, give me all the customers in the customers table that don't have any orders," and if I execute that, I get that John and Llewellyn, customer ID 2 and customer ID 5, don't have any orders, and that makes sense. So, so far so good, not in is working the way we want it to work. Now, the problem is, if I put a null value as a customer ID in the orders table, and so if I go back here, and I add a null customer ID in the orders table, and then I run this exact same query again. And now I get no results. And the reason why I get no results is because any comparison with null in the in or not in clause returns false. So potentially this null customer could be John or Llewellyn. It, it legitimately could be. And so they're not going to hand back um, those results because we don't know. Maybe it is John and Llewellyn, maybe it isn't. So we're just going to be on the safe side and, and uh, return false. So if I wanted to fix this, I've got three ways I can fix it. Way number one, we can make sure the columns that don't need null values are created with not null in the table. So if I come all the way up here to my table definition, this cust ID here, if I typed in not null here, then when I tried to insert a null, it wouldn't let me, and it would say, hey, you need a valid customer ID. I could create a form key relationship to really enforce that. Um, so that's one way I could do it, and that would stop the problem. Um, another way is we can strip out nulls in the subquery. You see this in the subquery where a cust ID is not null. So if I copy and paste that query, we should get John and Llewellyn back, right? And we do, because I'm saying take the null out of the subquery so the comparison's no longer there. And then finally, the other thing we can do is just avoid not in and instead use not exists. And not exists um, behaves with nulls the way we kind of intuitively expect it to because it exists only use two value logic, not three value logic. And then we get John and Llewellyn there. So I didn't exactly learn that in the reading, but um, I like the example and it's important to emphasize because I've seen that create bugs in a lot of different applications. Um, okay, Brad, did you learn anything in the reading? Yeah, I did, but I, it's actually from the group, but I actually have a question on that last step you just did. Can you walk through that not exists again? I'm not sure I understand that subquery actually. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you asked. Okay. So exists is kind of weird in that um, if we compare it to our original not in, it, you actually write it more intuitively, right? Where you say, give me cust ID from the orders table and then check customers table. If the cust ID isn't there, show it to me, right? That's, that's an easy query to read. This query is a little more complicated because this where clause joins the inner query with the outer query. It's, it's, in fact, you could rewrite this as a join and probably be um, easier to read. But basically what you're saying is um, show me all the orders that have customers. And then if you don't have a customer record that exists there, display that. So if I were going to write this in a join criteria, it would look actually more like this and would probably be easier to read. From customers, see left outer join orders O on C dot cust ID equals O dot cust ID, where O dot cust ID is null. So that left outer join says, give me all my customers if they happen to have an order, show me that. If they, and then my where clause then filters out all those that actually have an order. And so if I do that, I should get two customers, John and Llewellyn, with a whole bunch of null order ID, cust ID, and order date. So 
that's actually two ways of writing the query to get around the null problem. Um, if you think that this exists with this kind of weird join clause and the where clause is too difficult to read, you can actually write the same thing this way with the same results. Can you run both of those together? So like that top one, did it, it didn't return those three null fields, did it? It didn't, no. So in fact, the asterisk in the column is just me being lazy. Right. Um, probably what I should do is c dot cust id um, c dot cust name in both places. And the reason on the second query why you got those null columns is because you did the join, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yep. Right. Okay. All right. Cool. That makes sense. So the thing that I actually learned. Um, wasn't so much from the reading, it was actually from reading the Google group. I was following the thread that you were talking about that Shane was asking about when to use views. And as I was scrolling through, um, Marlon mentioned something that I hadn't heard about. He mentioned indexed views and I hadn't heard about those things. So I went and looked them up on MSDN and I'm not sure I fully understand them, but it, it seems like a kind of a cool feature. It sounds like from your response and Rob's response that maybe that's only available in enterprise level only. Maybe it's not used that often, but, um, I was trying to figure out why why is there an index view when it sounds like there's views and then there's tables and index view seems to sit in between. It seems like an index view almost should just be a table. Okay, so this is kind of an advanced topic. And um, if, it, if everyone's interested in this, I'll go ahead and talk about it. Raise your hand if you're interested in learning about index views. I don't even think they talk about it in the book at all, um, but I'm happy to talk about it. So Peter is and Jess is and... Brian is, okay, I think that's probably enough to, uh, to actually talk about it. Okay, um, I'll give it like a minute or two and then I'll stop talking. But basically, remember last time when I talked about physical um, query optimization here and if I click on um, the show the query plan, I get this third tab here and it shows this execution plan. Okay, well, the reason why this is important to see is you're seeing a join here, right? And that join is usually pretty expensive. In, in this case, it's 3%, but sometimes it can be much greater than that. And it can be, if I'm joining like eight or nine tables together, those join expenses can be pretty complicated. So what you mostly use an index view for is you create a view with all the join clauses and then you build an index on top of the view and it it writes all those tables out to disk with the join clause and then anytime somebody queries it it reads it off the disk instead of doing it in memory right and so you could potentially get a pretty significant performance increase by doing that um, rather than doing it in memory, having the optimizer do it in memory every single time. So that explains so, that explains why uh, the, the the section on MSDN says guidelines for designing an index view, and it says index views work best when the underlying data is infrequently updated, because they would have to rebuild those tables on disk if the data kept changing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a frequent updated table, then it's just one more place that you have to um, insert a new record, right? And that's actually true for all indexes. I mean, the danger for over-indexing anything is that you take a right hit, right? Indexes are great for reading, but they're bad for writing. And you just make that decision every time you add an index. We've got a question here from Peter. He says, is that a clustered index on the view? Um, well, that's a good question. If I don't know about the view definition, but by nature, um, no, it's not a clustered index because um, clustered indexes refer to the actual table structure. And so here, you're not exactly building your own table, right? You're, it is a, it's, it's more like a non-clustered covering index in, in design, um, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But um, in my head, that's what it seems to be like, is the non-clustered covering. Because you're not actually changing the structure of any of the underlying tables.
All right, so raise your hand if you guys learned something in chapters four through six, and then we'll call on you, and you can either type out what you learned, or um, you can use your mic. So anybody come prepared with something they learned today? Oh, Jess did. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Jess. Is your mic working? No mic. Okay, Jess will type it. It's a lot of pressure while everybody waits for the type. Uh, I really like the example of cross apply using a function. Right. Okay. So cross apply makes sense in a function. Um, that was that was interesting to me too. Um, I don't even know if I could quickly get a cross apply to work in the examples that I've done. I think I might be able to. Um, let me look at the order structure real quick. So order, OK, order one, two, and three. All right, let's see. Um, so if I create a function, this is going to be really tough. Create function, get orders, um, at cust ID, int, um, as, begin, end. And I think we're going to do returns int, right? And then um, go, go, OK. Um, and then returns um, at return. So declare at return int. Um, so, and we'll say return at return. OK. Select at return equals ca um, count from um, orders where cust ID equals at cust ID. All right, so let's see if that function actually works. It does, it does. OK, so technically, I should be able to say select dbo dot get orders. I should have said get order count, one, like this. And it said three. Is that right? If I go up to my structure, you see how order right, uh, customer ID 1 has three orders? Do you see that? OK. So um, that was that. That was right. You know what I should have done is um, said as, as order count. OK. So now let's see if I can play with this a little bit. What happens if I say? from customers C, and then here I say C.custID, and I say um, C.star. Will that work? And it will. Look, remember how John and Llewellyn have zero um, orders? So what I have is I have a function that takes a customer ID as a parameter, and then in a select statement, I'm handing in the primary key of the customer's table as that parameter, and I'm getting a count of all the orders that they have. All right, so that wasn't a great cross-apply um, example, because I did it at the top of my head. So what would be a good cross-apply example? I would have to return a table here. OK, so let's, let's change this. We'll say alter function returns table at um, cust ID at order count. And then, uh, you know what? This is going to be too much to type. Um, you know what? I'm going to type a lot if I do this, Brad. What do you think? Should I, should I keep going? Um, I think maybe we should kind of move on to your flashcards. And we have another question in there. P Peter said for the thing that he learned for the month, he said he learned about uh, common table expressions, CTEs. He said he didn't know much about them before. So I think maybe we can do, maybe we can post the cross apply to the group um, okay. as an example and then, and then move on. OK, all right, sounds good. But basically, how a cross apply would work, I can describe it, is I would return a table. And then when I return the table, instead of 
putting the scalar function in the column list, I would say from dbo.getOrders. And then if I wanted to feed a parameter into it still, I would use cross apply to feed the parameter into it instead of join. So that's the basic difference is I change this scalar from returning an int to a table, and then I can join it and cross apply to get the parameter into it. So you'll see that when I write the example out. Um, okay, CTEs. I love CTEs, and here's why. Um, let's take a look in the Northland database real quick. Um, actually, let's look in, yeah, here we go, T SQL 2012. And then I'll freeze Object Explorer. And I'll open up databases, and we'll go to T SQL 2012. Okay, so let's select star from order details again. Um, it's actually sales not order details. Okay, and here we see like unit price times quantity, right? And so I can say, um, give me order ID, product ID, unit price times quantity um, as total price. And then go ahead and run that. Quantity, did I do that wrong? What was it? Um, oh, Q2Y, okay. Unit price times Q2Y as total price. Okay, and then run that, okay. Now, you'll see that these order IDs have like, you know, $77, they have $100, they have $200, okay. So if I want to do a where clause, I want to do where total price greater than $100. And if I execute that, I get invalid column name total price. So what I have to do is I have to take this thing, copy it, and paste it. And now I've got that kind of thing twice, right? And that is repetitive and ugly. And so what I can do instead of using the where clause like that, the other thing is um, if I do it in a join clause or, or I want to do it in multiple columns, like I can do a, an average or something like that, I'm constantly repeating that expression. So what I can do instead of that is I can create a CTE with um, detail as, okay. That's now kind of a named query is the way I think about it in my head. And I can just say select star from detail. And look, I get the exact same results I had before. But I get one benefit, and that is where total price greater than 100, now I can use that alias name. And that is like a huge advantage because I can say, um, give me star plus over 100 as type. And then here, I can take the exact same query, union under 100. And now you see over 100 up there, and then down below, um, how far down below do I have to go? Way down below. Go, 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 go. You're under 100 down here. Okay. So I know that's kind of a silly example, but what I wanted you to see is that I can reference that um, that saved query multiple times, um, and I can represent that combined column multiple times. And this is just a really simple example of that. But if I had like a lot of kind of complicated stuff in here, like I wanted to say, give me the total per order, and then group by order ID. Actually, let's take the product ID out. So I change detail, and now all of a sudden, I really changed severely the logic of the entire query. Um, like you can see, now I've only got 830 rows instead of all the rows I had before. 
and I can see my total price for every order detail on every order summarized by order. Um, and I just changed the detail hidden query and I didn't change any of the queries that were relying on it and it just worked flawlessly. So yeah, that's definitely a huge ex advantage of, um, of CTEs. Anybody else, Brad, have any questions or uh, things they learned? Nope, that looks like it's it. If anybody else has a question, feel free to raise your hand or just type it right in the question box. Oh, Diane just posted one here. It says, uh, could you please talk something about recursive CTEs? I understand the result shown in the book. Right, that's, um, that's kind of a big, that's kind of a big um, deal right there. Um, and she posts, and she posts an error message here that she's getting. Recursive common table expression CTE underscore manager does not contain a top level union all operator. Um, wait, what did she say? Says, uh, yeah, so she's wondering what it, what the error means. So she's looking at the example of CTEs on the book in the book. Uh, I don't have the page number in front of me. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So I can write this out. If you recursion is very tough. Um, first of all, I should probably explain what recursion even is. Recursion is basically a function that calls itself to get a result from itself. And I know that's a really complicated thing to say, but the popular example is like navigating a hierarchy or a tree. Like if you were a grandson and you needed to know your, your grandfather, you would say, get parent twice. And it would be great if you could say, okay, Ike's parent is Scott and Scott's parent is Warren. So you call yourself, you say, get parent for Ike and you get Scott. And then you say, get parent for Scott and you get Warren. And then the return result finally is Warren. And that's a basic example of what recursion is. And it can be very complicated in any language to implement recursion. And it's complicated in SQL. Um, and so I'm going to write out a um, quick example. Um, if you guys have a minute, go ahead and pray for me. And I'll see if I can get it done. So this is a basic numbers table. And I start out my CT with a with clause. Oh, by the way, anybody know why I use a semicolon before a with? Um, it's because the CT has to be the only um, command statement. And so um, you always begin it with a semicolon, or um, it doesn't know when the CT actually begins. So the semicolon is required on CTEs. It's going to be required for all statements pretty soon. But it's definitely required for CTUs, and that's why I start it and end it with the semicolon. OK, so if I say um, select 0 as number, um, let's just go ahead and run that. Do you see how 0 is my number column? That's a pretty simple query, right? And then if I say, union all, and notice that's where your error is coming from, is that you don't have the union all. That's a requirement for recursion. And then I say select number plus one from my numbers, where number less than a thousand. Let's do a hundred for now. Okay, this is recursion. Notice that I called the CTE my numbers. The I have to seed a base value somehow, so I'm seeding the base value of zero. And then I'm saying call myself and add one to it as long as the number is less than a, a hundred. And the way I kick the whole thing off is through um, the regular query for the CT at the bottom. So I say um, select star from my numbers, semicolon, and execute, and look at my result. I get zero all the way to 100. Oh, it stopped. That's when it knew the last thing to stop was it said, go to the my number CTE 
if numbers less than 99 stop, oh, and by the way, add 1 to it. And that's why I'm getting 100 in the result. OK, so I realize that's kind of a simple example of um, recursion. But look how useful it is. If I actually needed numbers 1 through 100 or 0 through 100, this is a great way of getting that really, really quickly without, you know, think about what I'd have to do without recursion. I'd probably have to do like select 0 as number, union select 1, union select 2, union select 3. I'd have to type all of that out. And this is just a really easy way of getting um, those numbers written out for me. So yeah, one of the requirements for recursion to work is the union all. Um, and what, if you remember from chapter six, what union all says is we're going to allow duplicates. If, if there's the same value more than once, that's okay. We're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come in the re return result anyway. We're not going to strip it out. Does that help, Diane? Yep, she said that that helped. Um, and we have one more okay. question. Uh, I think this is from what they learned. It says correlated CTEs are very useful when trying to find all activity for a given group because it uses line by line of the outer query and returns the criteria of the inner to outer query where criteria match. For example, finding activity for a given contractor for a given time period. OK, so I think he said correlated CTEs, but I think what he actually meant was correlated subqueries. Um, is that true? Mignon, is that true? Yeah. That, that's true. He did mean correlated subqueries, yeah. right? OK, so correlated subqueries are hugely complicated. And I can, I can type it out right now um, and kind of show you. So if I do a select star from orders, um, actually, it's sales.orders. So bear with me, by the way, while I do this, because you know it's kind of difficult to do examples at the last minute um, when you guys ask questions. So if I mess up, please uh, bear with me, because none of this is planned beforehand. I'm just doing it off the top of my head. So right here, you see a freight column. So if I wanted to say, Cust ID freight. Look, I can see all the different cust IDs in their freight. And if I do order by cust ID, see how I see customer ID one has all this freight? Well, if I wanted to sum it so I get a total of all the freight, I execute that and I get an error. And it says you can't sum it because you've got a column, cust ID, that's not being summed or in a group by clause. So remember, I have to tell T-SQL, we learned that from last month's reading, that um, what I'm going to be grouping on. And now it works the way I would want it to work, right? You see how it says cust ID 1, total freight, $225.58. OK. All right. So that's working OK. But now what happens um, if I want to um, have that compared to the to the average total freight. That would be interesting, right? Um, let me think. How can I do a correlated subquery example that would make sense? Um, okay. What would happen if I want the detail back? So let's put freight here. And now what I want to see is I want to see the freight next to the total freight. That's a good example. OK, and it says, sorry, you can't do that because freight isn't in the um, aggregate or the group by. So what I have to do is come here and put freight down here in the group by. And now I'm really not getting what I want to be getting from this query, am I? Because as soon as I add the group by back, I'm missing that original result that I had before, the $225 for customer ID 1. And watch, I'll prove that. If I take freight out, and I take freight out here, remember, for customer ID 1, I want this $225.58. 
So what I'm trying to accomplish in this query is I want the 121 and the 225 to be in the total freight column in order for the report to work correctly. So what I can do is kind of mess around with that a little bit. I can say, okay, um, I don't want the sum here. So let's take the sum out and see what results I get real quick. With the sum out, I just get customer ID 1 and the freight. Now I'm going to put the sum back in, but I don't want the group by. So the way I do that is with the subquery. I say select sum freight from orders 02, we'll call this one 01, and then I'll, and I'll say this is total freight. And then I'll execute that. Um, oh, it's sales numbers, excuse me. I always make that mistake because of schema. Okay. And look, I'm not getting the 225 anymore, am I? I'm getting 64,942. That's actually, that's actually bad results. The reason why I'm getting that is because it's summing from the entire table, right? It's not summing um, by customer. So the way I get it to sum by customer is by saying where 01.custID um, equals 02.custID as total freight. And now I execute that, and now I'm getting the 225 that I wanted. So I can see customer ID 1 had $29, and then they had a total freight of 225.58. And I can kind of see the comparison. If I wanted to be fancy, okay, wait, let's stop right there and talk about what's happening. The correlated subquery says take the customer ID from the outer query. This query right here, this from right here is the outer query. Submit that customer ID to the inner query and then summarize their freight. So the first time this executes, it submits customer ID 1 as the outer query to the inner query and it gets a total freight of $225.58. And then it returns that result every time until the next customer ID 2 happens. And then the outer query submits customer ID 2 to the inner query, and then it gets a summarized freight of 97.42 coming back out until it hits customer ID 3. So I realize this is very complicated because developers are used to seeing this as like um, a procedural thing, right? You would see this as like we would loop through one at a time in order to get these results. But this is much faster because SQL is set-based. And so SQL allows us to um, do this all at once. And at the same time, it's, um, it knows, OK, he wants every value from the outer query to be submitted to the inner query, and then we want the results to be returned. So that's a correlated subquery. Now, I actually think that correlated subqueries are better as CTEs rather than using correlated subquery. And the way I would do that, oh, by the way, are you guys all with me so far? I hope I didn't lose anybody. I'm with you. Okay. I, you're with me, okay. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in a CTE, and you can see why it's better and what cool things it can do with it. So if I say, with total freight okay and rather than do this where clause here i'm just going to put that original grouping back in i'm going to say group by cust id and then here cust id comma freight as total freight okay Let's just make sure that inner query works. OK, it does. See the customer ID 1 has 225.58. One of the problems with the correlated subquery that uh, we talked about earlier is if I execute the inner query, I get no results because it doesn't know what 01 is. So correlated subqueries are difficult to test by themselves, which is why I really don't like them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that correlated subquery out And instead, I'm going to say join 
total freight TF on o1.custid equals tf.custid. Um, and then go ahead and execute the whole thing. Let's see, did I mess up somewhere? Um, O1 join. I don't know why I'm getting bad results here. It looks solid to me. Hang on. So I see the width. Let, let, let me just execute this middle thing and make sure that works. It does. Okay. So select cust ID freight tf dot total freight from O1 join O1 cust ID equals tf dot cust ID. Um, oh, with at, total at freight time. as. Excuse me. There we go. Um, and then this is uh, o1.cust ID, and this will be o1.cust ID, excuse me. Okay, so look, I used a CTE, and I got the exact same results as I got with the correlated subquery. And that is way easier to read. One, I can test the CTE easier. And two, now that I'm joining the CTE, I can do all sorts of cool stuff with this total freight. Like right here, I could say, um, give me. Um, freight divided by total freight as percent contribution or something like that. And I can even like say, okay, take that times 100. And now I'm seeing this as a percentage, right? I'm seeing, oh, and the other thing I can do is I can add any column I want to. Like I can say, order ID. Okay, so now I can see order ID 10643 contributes 13% of that customer's total freight and then order ID 10692 contributes 27% of that customer's total freight. See, isn't that way cool? Um, it's way easier to write something like this in a CTE than it would be with a correlated subquery. You know what I'd have to do to write this with a correlated subquery would be like insane. I would have to take that correlated subquery and I have to repeat it here under total freight and then I have to repeat it here again under percent contributing um, and anywhere I wanted to use that correlated subquery I'd have to repeat the entire query that entire complicated query I'd be writing over and over and over again so um, you can see CT is really shine in this example that's cool I, like I think that. I impressed myself. I hope you guys followed along with me. <laughs> okay. Um, um, okay. So that's one thing we can do with it. Um, you know, there's another thing we can do with CTEs that where CTEs really shine. Select top 10 cust ID from sales orders. Okay, so hang on a second. Let, let's do let's do this with the CTE. Hang on. So with cusp total orders as select cust ID count as total orders from sales dot orders um, group by cust ID select star from cust total orders. Okay, so you see how customer ID 1 has 6 and customer ID 2 has 4 and customer ID 3 has 7 orders and cust ID 4 has 13 orders. Okay, and that guy's got 30. That's a lot, right? Okay, so what I can do here is I can order by order by total orders descending um, let's just highlight that by itself. Uh oh. Wait one second. See if I get valid data. OK. 
and it should execute. There we go. Okay. So do you see how this is like customer ID 71 it has 31 orders, 20 has 30, 63 has 28. Okay, so I could say this is my top 10 cust total orders, and I could say give me the top 10, leave that order by in, and then give me a total. Okay, so my top 10 customers are customer ID 71, 20, 63, 24, 37, and so forth. So, so far, does that make sense? If I, if I organize my customers by order count, the guys that order for me the most, these guys are my top 10 customers. And that's very helpful. And that, that CTE made it very easy for me to look at that. Now, there's another thing I can do, and that is I can use a window function, which we haven't really talked about yet. Um, we'll talk about that in a coming chapter. Um, to number each one of these things, 1 through 10. And the way I do that is by using the row number function. And the row number function looks like this. It's row number um, let's see, hang on one second. Um, hmm, that's not exactly um, by Let's see. Um, I bet if I could do the count, can I do that? Hmm, that's not what I wanted either. Um, Um, trying to get a good row number here. I wonder if I just did no. Yeah. Order by. Um, see, I think I should be able to do count. And I can't. Um, I just do a string literal here. Yeah. Um, let's me take a look at that. What, are, what am I getting back here? I'm getting terrible results here. So what I want. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm gonna get the results I want from your number. As long as I've got the group by. Let me think this through for just a second. Um, hmm. Or you know what I could do? I can do um, order by count descending. There we go. Okay. All right. That, that works well. Okay. Okay. So um, what you're seeing is an actual number placement in my results set showing me my top 10 customers. And I realize that seems a little bit silly now, but let me show you how that's really helpful. What I can do is take this exact CTE that I just made for total customer orders And I can say um, total employee count as and paste it. So let me 
grab that whole query real quick. Okay. And instead of cust ID, I'm going to make it imp ID. Imp ID. Okay. Now what this gives me, let me go ahead and execute this, is I just turned it on its head. I said employee ID 4 has taken 156 orders. Employee ID 3 has taken 127 orders. Employee ID 1 took 123 orders. Okay. So do you see how one one query gives me my customers and their top orders, and the next query gives me my employees and their top orders. Now, why is that cool? It's cool because what I can do here is I can say join the employees. So we'll call that C, we'll call this E on C dot row num equals E dot row num. Execute that, and look what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing customer ID 71 is my top customer, and employee ID 4 is my top employee. Now, I realize that sounds really silly to you guys, but what happens if somebody asked, I want to make sure that my best employees are taking care of my best customers, so I want to see them side by side. I want my best employee to get my best customer, my second best employee to get my second best customer, and so forth. That query is like impossible in T-SQL without CTEs. And you can see how CTEs really make um, that process shine, how easy it is to, to use a CTE for that. Um, let me just kill my results real quick. Um, for some reason, T-SQL, my control R doesn't work. Um, let me just throw this down here real quick. Okay. And you can kind of see that query in all of its glory right there. Um, yeah, CTs make that really, really simple. And without it, it's like next to impossible. Um, and then I use the windowing function to kind of join two logical things that don't have a logical relationship. I just kind of created that relationship all by myself. That's pretty cool. Right. I like that. Just to do a... Uh... A time check. We're at twelve fifty-five, so maybe we could start wrapping up. We only have a few more minutes left. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know what? For the last thing, I can make a CTE that calls the first CTE. That's actually pretty easy. If I come back to the total freight example, I can actually look what I can do here. This is kind of cool. Another thing you can do with CTEs that I didn't show. And that is um, total, um, complete total freight. That's a terrible name, but bear with me. And I can say select sum total freight from total freight. OK, we need an as clause. We learned that from the last back presentation. OK. Um, OK, why am I getting a red here? Um, oh, as, as total freight. OK, now that might seem a little bit silly, but what I can do here is I can say um, select total freight from complete total freight um, as a subquery. as complete total. And now, remember that one, remember when I screwed up the correlated subquery on purpose? I did that on purpose, and we got the 64,942 number. Well, now you can see that customer's freight on the order compared to the customer's total freight, the contribution percentage, and then the complete total. Super fancy. I would say, give me that subquery. Um, and divide that by this number, so uh, by total freight. So I actually, we'll say total freight divide by that as customer contribution. Do 
just kind of doing this in my head, so bear with me. Okay, so we can see that the customer's contribution is 0.3%. So we could actually multiply that whole thing by 100 to get a better percentage. Um, okay, so 0.34%. Customer ID 1 is 0.34% of my total freight. Customer 2 is 0.15%. Customer three is 0.41. So you can see that the numbers are actually adding up. But that is an example of a CTE calling another CTE, perhaps needlessly, but it's still a good example of it. And then having the calling query um, call, uh, call the query that's calling a query. So it's a kind of a complicated query in this regard, but um, you can see that with CTEs, you can kind of shape the data the way you want it to look. You know what would be interesting is to actually see the execution plan here, and you can see how, what SQL has to do in order to give us the results back. I bet it's pretty ugly. Yeah, look at all those aggregates and all the looping in computing. Remember how we had that original join and we said, look at that nested loop join? Um, look at everything SQL has to do to, to get these CTE results back to us. Lots of aggregates. It's probably not the most efficient thing I've ever written, but it's a good example nonetheless. Shane has one more question here. Um, All right, you guys. It says, is it better to yeah. use recursive routine to generate numbers or build a number table like the author? OK, so the answer is both. I create a numbers table and use the recursive CTE to populate it. So rather than type it by hand or something. Cool. like it. Yeah, but the numbers table is really useful, and you saw how many cool places he used it. So I know we said we'd get to flashcards, but, but we'll do flashcards another time. I really like CTEs, and I'm glad to have the chance to kind of explain them to you guys and, and talk about CTEs to you guys. So does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up? All right, you guys. Well, we've got three more chapters next week, so chapters 7, 8, and 9. And I will post that on the reading and update the website. And then I'll put the webinar up so you guys can join. Hopefully, you found this useful. And I will see you in June. Thanks, everyone.